Thank you for having me here. It's a pleasure. Those introductions make me nervous because after uh, getting credit for all those things related to climate change, you're going to blame me because the problem hasn't been anywhere near solved. But if you just hold that. Um, I'm going to talk, I'm going to eventually try to get to the sea level rise issue, particularly in the, case, in the context of New York City and what it may or may not do about the problem. Uh, but first, I'm going to give a general, given that this is, a, I understand, a rather, an audience with rather broad interest, so I'm going to give a general introduction to climate change to set up uh, the question of sea level rise. So, uh, for those of you who don't know, certain gases exist that exist naturally in the atmosphere are transparent to sunlight. There's a sun coming down. That's what warms Earth's surface. Some of these same gases trap heat that would otherwise escape into, into space. That's the greenhouse effect. It was identified almost 200 years ago. We know a lot about the physics of the greenhouse effect. There's no doubt that it works. We see it working on Mars and Venus. The main reason Venus is much hotter than the Earth is not because it's closer to the sun, but because it has much more carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. One of the reasons that uh, Mars is uh, much cooler than the Earth uh, is it's partly due to the distance from the sun, but it's also to a lesser extent, but at a significant extent, due to the lower greenhouse effect on Mars, due to the absence of water vapor. So the greenhouse effect is a good thing. Of course, without it, Earth would be about 60 degrees Fahrenheit colder than it is today. It would be a frozen desert. Life would not evolve in this form, and probably not in any form that needs to uh, f flourish on the surface. So that's the greenhouse effect. The greenhouse problem arises, as we'll see in a moment, because human activities are building up the levels of these gases. Um, we know this because we have a very good archive of what the atmosphere used to look like. We go to Antarctica, Greenland, tropical glaciers, and drill uh, things uh, using devices that look like oil derricks go down. At the center of these ice sheets, the ice is 12,000 feet thick, for instance. You bring up sections of the core, as you can see the gentleman on the lower right holding. Or maybe it's a woman. It is a woman. And um, take that into a lab, section it under clean conditions. And in the, the ice are trapped air bubbles. And that's because if you think about the way ice forms, snowflakes fall. They have points. The points attract air molecules. Those air molecules kind of get released into the crevices as the, as the snowflakes come together. They get compacted as more and more snow falls. Then it consolidates. The air can't escape. So we have bubbles in this ice that is more or less representative of the atmosphere as it was whenever the snow fell that formed the ice. And in the case of the oldest ice we've seen, it's about a million years old. So if you go deep enough in, the, deep enough in these ice sheets, you can get very, very old ice. The ice up to about 800,000 years has been carefully analyzed. And you can bring it up, section it, release the air, and be able to tell something about what the atmosphere was made of at that time. And I'll show you that in a minute. But in addition, the isotope ratios of the water, the, the atoms in the water from which, the, which fell from the atmosphere as snow, which formed the ice, et cetera, et cetera, those isotope ratios tell us roughly what the temperature of the atmosphere was from which the snow fell that formed the ice long, long ago. So we've got two records that we can study together. Here's one of the records. This is carbon dioxide, and it's only for the last 10,000 years. This is 10,000 years ago, about when civilization began. Uh, this area was just about at the edge of a large ice sheet because it was the end of the last major ice uh, glaciation, last ice age. That's roughly today. This is the last 200,000 years, uh, sorry, 200 years blown up. And you'll see that carbon dioxide levels were fairly steady. There was a little increase over this at this time, about 5,000 years ago, which many attribute to the beginning of large-scale deforestation by human beings. But the big increase starts about 200 years ago, and that is clearly related to the beginning of industrialization plus the acceleration of deforestation. And there are many, at least four separate independent lines of evidence that prove that the buildup is almost entirely due to human activity. And right now, Carbon dioxide, which is the major human-made greenhouse gas, is at a level about 43% above what it was in the pre-industrial period here. So we've had a big effect on the atmosphere already, and we understand why. These are the emissions of, the, of three of the important greenhouse gases. Carbon dioxide is the green. 
The orange is methane and the red is nitrous oxide. Methane is a product of anaerobic, uh, uh, any anaerobic process, like at the bottom of a landfill, you'll get methane. In fact, we tap these to add to our natural gas supply because methane is a major component of natural gas. Nitrous oxide is a process, is results from various bacterial processes that result uh, from agriculture generally and under human-made conditions. There are natural processes that result in nitrous oxide emissions also. But in any case, these uh, concentrations of these gases, I'm sorry, emissions of these gases into the atmosphere have increased continuously over the industrial period. And this graph here shows you the gray is the fossil fuel contribution to um, uh, carbon dioxide increase. The uh, yellow or orange is the contribution from deforestation. And one minor bit of good news in all this is that the uh, contribution from deforestation appears to have decreased in the last decade. And this is probably due to improved policies uh, on the part of the Brazilian government, which has acted to slow down the deforestation of the Amazon, at least temporarily. You don't know what will happen uh, with the political situation in Brazil. Why are, are uh, carbon dioxide emissions go, uh, increasing due to industrialization? Well, there are more people, and there are more people who want more stuff. And in fact, the biggest factor in the increase in emissions is this dark blue here, which is the part of the increase in emissions due to the increase in per capita income, basically. So as humans are better off in some sense, they're also loading these gases into the atmosphere. It's worth noting that some, and by the way, this is the part strictly due to population increase, the lighter blue. There are some features in this diagram which are below zero. That means those are changes which actually reduce carbon dioxide emissions. For instance, economies tend to get more efficient as they develop. And that's had a significant effect in holding down the increase, but not, you know, not nearly sufficient to offset it. And the rate of increase in the last decade was greater than in any previous decade. Now, this has had an effect on the climate already. The top figure is the global average temperature change as measured by thermometers uh, at Earth's surface. You, there's a thermometer in the, in the middle of England that goes back to, or at least the location, goes back to about 1650. But in fact, there weren't good enough uh, reliable sets of thermometers with data that was in any sense uh, reliable until around, the, around 1850, which is why this record starts there. And you can see that Earth's temperature, although it stagger steps a lot because there's a lot of year-to-year -year noise in the climate system, that the trend has in general been up, interrupted by some notable hesitations in warming. And those have a variety of reasons uh, that they occur. The, the biggest one you see between about 1940 and 1970, uh, this slow down here, is probably a combination of a natural fluctuation where energy moved from the atmosphere to the ocean temporarily and then came back out. But it's also because there was a large increase in coal burning around this period, which releases not only carbon dioxide, but particulate matter, which has a slight cooling effect. This record is understood fairly well. And most of the warming that you see, particularly since 1950, can be attributed through a variety of, of different uh, methods, which I'll talk about one later, to human activity. So that most of the warming since about 1950 is connected with this buildup of carbon dioxide and the other greenhouse gases. Concomitant with that change, and this is important for the uh, later in my talk, sea level has been rising. Why does sea level rise when the Earth warms? There are three generic factors. Number one, ice melts, primarily mountain glaciers, but also the two big ice sheets, the one in Greenland and Antarctica, and if ice is on land and it melts and the water drains into the ocean, that's going to raise sea level because it puts more mass in the ocean. The other is a strict volume effect. That's because as you warm most fluids, they're going to expand. So even if we weren't adding water to the ocean, the water that's there already would take up more volume. The net effect of that 
is that since about 1900, we've got scattered data in here from what are called tide gauges, little flotation devices. Then as we go on, we get more tide gauges. Different, these different curves are different ways to analyze the data. Don't worry about the details. But as you get here, in the last 20 years, that red spot, that red line there, is satellite data when we essentially bounce signals off the ocean surface and can measure very accurately uh, how high the ocean surface is. And as opposed to the flotation devices, which are in coastal areas, the red curve or the satellite data is virtually global. And it's interesting that the, the two line up very well. The trend is a bit faster in the satellite data. And that's believed to be because there actually has been an acceleration in warming recently. But it's, it's, this is a faster trend here than the long run here. As you can see, there's kind of a gradual acceleration. So sea level rose about 20 centimeters or about 8 inches over the past century. And that may not sound like a lot, but on a typical East Coast beach, if, and by the way, in New York area, it's gone up by a foot. We, we're unlucky for reasons I'll uh, talk about later. We're, if sea level goes up by a, on a, by a foot on a typical East Coast beach around New York, say, it takes away 100 feet inland due to submergence and erosion. And that's why we pay millions of dollars every year to keep restoring the beaches as one reason. And it's not going to slow down. It's likely to speed up in the future. So I'll get back to sea level a little later. And there are other large-scale changes that are happening. This is a photo that I took through an airplane window where uh, fortuitously my plane, which was flying back from uh, Asia, went almost over the North Pole, not quite. And this is July. The minimum, the ice minimum, the, the minimum of ice extent in the Arctic is September. So this is only halfway through the unfreezing season. And you can see there's a tremendous amount of breakup in the ice, even very close to the pole. And there are two things to note about that. Number one, it's because the warming is biased towards the poles. There's about twice as much warming occurring at the high latitudes as the global average. So there are massive changes happening. And you get a replacement here of reflecting surface ice with dark surface of water that absorbs heat sunlight instead of reflecting it. So this is part of a process called a positive feedback on the warming. As the Earth warms, as the ice breaks up, as you get rid of reflective surfaces, you, enhance, you further enhance the warming. It's a positive feedback. You can see that over there. OK, so why should we believe that any of this is tied to human activity? that is the, the climate change. There have been a lot of other climate changes, such as intensification of precipitation, drying in certain areas. The part of it that we are most confident is directly tied to human activity is the sea level rise, but at the base of that is the temperature change. And you can see here uh, one of several lines of evidence. There are three features of these graphs. First of all, they're at different continents, or so different regions of Earth, obviously. In addition, you'll notice that there are uh, three different curves in each case. The black line is the measured temperature data, which I showed you a few minutes ago. This is the global mean temperature change. The purple smear and the uh, pink smear represent, if you take all the computer climate models and you bundle them together into what's called an ensemble, and you run them, and you see, let them predict what the temperature change should have been over this 100-year period. And you do it in two different modes. In the first mode, the purple mode, you let the models pretend that there was no buildup of greenhouse gases. Didn't happen. In the second mode, you plug in the actual increase as measured in the atmosphere, using those ice cores, among other evidence. And you see that in area by area around the world, that there's a pretty good correspondence between the pink curve, the actual curve generated by models with the greenhouse gas buildup. And for the last 50 or 60 years, a, a pretty horrendous match between the actual measured temperature and what the models predict. So that shows you you need the greenhouse gases to be able to project, or it's called hindcasting, what actually happened on the surface of the Earth. This is one of several lines of evidence. In addition the, uh, to the time um, 
the, mar the uh, march of change over time being consistent. The, the, as I said, the geographic pattern looks consistent, and the vertical pattern in the atmosphere is also quite consistent with what you would predict from the buildup of the greenhouse gases. There are natural sources of climate change which can affect the climate over a 100-year period. But these have been measured directly by satellite observations. There is the, sol the changes in the sun, it flickers a little bit, are not big enough nearly to explain these changes. Neither are changes in the volcanic dust veil, which tends to reflect sunlight. And when you add these two natural things to get natural changes together, you, you, what you actually get is the climate should have cooled instead of warming. And the only other factor over the short period that can affect the climate really in any significant way is variability, natural variability of the climate. The flickering I showed you in the other graph, we can estimate what the flickering should have done from the climate models, and it's nowhere near big enough. So these three factors together might account for 20% or so of the warming at best, probably not even that much. Excuse me. So it's human activity is the fundamental reason. Now, let's go back to the discussion a few minutes ago about ice core data. I said that there were two things that you could infer from ice core data. One is the level of greenhouse gases. The blue curve here is the level of carbon dioxide. This is it's not actually today. It's about 1,000 or 2,000 years ago. You can't, the top of the ice core doesn't help you very much in this case. This is 400,000 years ago. The actual end of this core is back over here someplace about 800,000 years ago. So I'm just taking about the, the, the most recent uh, 400,000 years. And you notice a few things about this. Uh, this is, again, carbon dioxide. This is the temperature, again, inferred from the isotope ratios in the, in the ice. And by the way, there's the current carbon dioxide level. So the current carbon dioxide level, as I said, is 43% above what it was in pre-industrial times. Not only that, it's 43, it's way above, more than 43%, no, no, I'm sorry, slightly less than 43% because there's some slightly high peaks here. Above, it's way above whatever the, the highest levels of carbon dioxide in the last 400, and again, if I had the rest of the slide with me, the last 800,000 years, yes? So the blue is the carbon dioxide, is that right? Correct. So why is it the carbon dioxide uh, What? Yes. No, it does. It actually doesn't follow. There's, in fact, for most of these changes, the carbon dioxide and the temperature change are so close together that you can't distinguish it. We can't resolve them. There's been a big argument over that for a long time. We don't, we don't actually know for most of these changes, the big ones, which led which. Now, why was this happening at all? These changes, these big changes between a warm period and a cold period. This is when the, when the Earth, w uh, when the northern hemisphere was about half glaciated, back to a warm period. These changes are triggered by changes in Earth's orbital inclination. Uh, the Earth's orbit has uh, several dimensions of, of um, goes through several cycles. When those, as those cycles change gradually, the amount of sunlight hitting one, orb, one uh, hemisphere or the other at one time of year or another changes. That can trigger various changes in the amounts of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere, and that in turn could actually cause the temperature to, uh, t the CO2 level to lead the temperature. So we don't, I, this is one of the big uncertainties. We do not know for sure which is the key mechanism which is triggered by the orbital changes and brings about these oscillations. But what we do know is that the amount of difference in carbon dioxide between a peak and a minimum is about what you need to explain this temperature change through the greenhouse effect when you adjust it for things like the ice sheets were also changing and therefore Earth's reflectivity was changing. But these changes yeah. are very yeah. abrupt of the orbital. Some of, them are very, some of them are very, right, that's right. But Orbital changes are gradual, and then all of a sudden the system jumps, and we do not have a good idea why. So the orbits will change relatively slowly, it's gradual changes, then all of a sudden both these things jump. And there are theories about why that happens. There is no unique theory. We don't have a good answer. What it tells you is that there are strong nonlinear feedbacks in the system, and that, you know, I mean, my interpretation of that is there's a risk of the system responding quickly as we play with it going into the future. Does that but, effect have a name? 
there are different there are different reasons for the there are different types of jumps at different periods, and they have different names. One of them is called the dance god Ashkar events. The other is called uh, yeah, it's a Milankov the orbital change of the Milankovitch cycles identified a long time ago. And there is no special name for the correlation that I know of. Okay? So this is the nature of the Evans. It's consistent with what we know about the way the greenhouse effect is supposed to work. It's consistent with giving us the right magnitude. We've got the magnitude of the greenhouse effect right for today's changes, for the changes hundreds of thousands of years ago. But these mechanisms are somewhat perplexing. And they're also somewhat troubling for the reason the gentleman uh, led me to a minute ago. Now, there's one other fundamental point I want to make about the system, and that's that carbon dioxide is a very long lifetime in the atmosphere. If you think about it like uh, pour pouring water from a faucet in a drain, in a, in a sink with a drain, where the drain is kind of plugged, you can imagine tuning the faucet so that the level stays constant, or tuning the faucet so the level increases, or turning the faucet lower so that the level decreases. We're in a situation now where the flow in, which is emissions, is such that the level's continually increasing. We could turn down the faucet gradually, that is slow down emissions, and eventually the level would start to drop. But the thing is, the sink is clogged, you know, hairballs, whatever. And it's very, very slow to drain out. So that, and this is modeling, this is, we, we don't have a, a real life experiment on this yet, what, at least not globally. If you pump up the greenhouse gases and you estimate what the surface warming would be, and then in, in about this year, which is 2100, no, it's 2050, I, I think. If all of a sudden you turned everything off, blow up all the factories, shut down the power plants, run all the cars into the ocean, stop convert everything to renewable energy, nuclear energy, whatever, the temperature gr comes down, but very, very gradually, and then kind of plateaus. This is now, this is the year 3000. That's how slowly the, the, the temperature goes down, and that's because the carbon dioxide is going down slowly. Yes? So would the temperature ever go down completely the way it used to be? It can't go down completely to what it used to be unless you get all of the carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere, all the extra carbon dioxide. And then it isn't 100% clear that would happen either. There could be what's called a hysteresis in the system. We could have caused some irreversibility to happen, which would take us back on a different path, something in the deep ocean. But let's say if you got all the carbon dioxide that humans had put up out, if you got the other greenhouse gases out, if you shut down human-made emissions, brought the system back into balance, it's a good bet that over the course of a long time, the temperature would come back to what it used to be. Interesting question. What do you want the temperature to be? Let's say we had the power to tune it. You know, we're worried about tuning it forward. In another 20 or 30,000 years, it could be another ice age due to one of those changes in Earth's orbit. What would we do then? It, and we will have the power to do something about it, assuming we don't blow ourselves up in the meantime. You know. Is there an argument to be made that higher temperatures are good? That you can grow more food? You can have more land area? There are people who make the argument that higher CO2 is good because it's a fertilizer, higher temperature is good. When you look closely at those arguments and peel it back, they don't stand up if you get more than a degree or so outside of today's temperature range. But, you know, within a degree either way, I don't think we have a good understanding of you know, who benefits and who loses, basically. You get up one, two degrees, everybody starts losing. At least that's what we think today. So that's all the past. Let's talk about the future. These are, two, these are projections of what temperature could look like in the future under two possible scenarios. The lower scenario is we get our act together, get emissions under control, start cranking them down, and keep warming from exceeding a couple of degrees Celsius, which is the high end of the purple smear here. This is sort of business as usual. Just let it rip. Don't worry about it. We'll deal with it whenever it happens or as it happens. Now, I want you to notice two sets of uncertainties here. You should always keep in mind there's a lot of uncertainty about this problem. You don't ever want to fool yourself about our predictive capacities. One uncertainty is the smear in either the orange or the purple curve. What that smear is, in this case, they took 39 climate models, 
some of which are truly independent of each other, many of which are not really, because there was somebody's graduate student that went away and built the model. Uh, another, and 32 in this case. And you average them together. And this is the range you get in the predictions from those different models. So that's one. And that range is almost entirely due to what's called the cloud feedback factor. That is, aside from that ice feedback I showed you a minute ago, there are also feedbacks because as the world warms, more water evaporates from the ocean. As it evaporates, it goes up in the atmosphere and forms clouds. As it forms clouds, well, some of those clouds are at low altitudes, like the ones that were uh, raining on us a bit ago. If you were up in an airplane above those clouds, they would be white on top because they're reflecting a lot of light. They have a cooling effect. If you go way up near the top of the lowest part of the atmosphere, the troposphere, you get these high, thin cirrus clouds, the one you see on a fair weather day about a day ahead of a storm coming in. Those have more of the effect of trapping heat, just like the greenhouse gases that made a little ice chunks. It is very hard to project how much the little thin clouds are going to increase versus, or decrease at any particular spot versus how much the reflective puffy clouds are going to increase or decrease at any particular spot. We don't know enough about the physics of cloud formation to, to answer the question right. And it's different at every place on Earth. Some places in the atmosphere are going to warm enough to evaporate clouds. And that effect will dominate. Other places, there'll be more humidity and the extra cloud formation will dominate. We don't have a good answer. A lot of people have worked on it for a long time. And the different models have different estimates. And that's why there is this range. And that's an uncertainty which has not closed over several decades. The other uncertainty is, what's the future? Are, <laughs> are, are we going to let it just go? Are we going to not let it go? Are there going to be policies to, make the, to close this gap? Are in, or what technologies will we have? We don't actually know what business as usual is. We can't predict technologies 50 years ahead. We can't even predict them 10 years ahead. So we don't know what kind of cars, whether we'll be using cars at all. What kind of um, power we'll be using. Will it be mostly fossil fuel like today? Or will the price of uh, solar and renewable, other renewables to keep going down the way it's been going? Then surprises happen. Natural gas discoveries. Natural gas has a different emission factor than carbon dioxide. Emits less per unit of energy use. All these things are very, very difficult to predict. So, these are storylines. They are not projections of the future. But given the, the basic story as of either this or that or anything in between, you would infer a different amount of climate change. And the, what difference does it make? Well, this level of warming is something that a country like the US could probably tolerate. Um, there would be certain areas, particularly coastal areas, that would find difficulty. But it's probably manageable. Poorer countries would have greater difficulty. And for some of them, the changes would, even at this low level of warming, be unmanageable. And they would have, they would have, some, they would have some real chaos in some of these countries. For the higher emissions, I, have, I don't have any colleagues who wouldn't say that over here that this isn't the potential for disaster. And we don't know whether we're going to get, as of today, whether we're going to get this, this, or something in between. What we do know is if emissions are lowered, we have a higher chance of winding up down here than up there. <clears throat> and this is the distribution of warming across the surface of the face of the Earth. This is for a, the low emission scenario. This is for the high emission scenario. Notice the temperature changes, particularly at the high latitudes, but also the mid-continental areas. We're talking about warmings. And this is Celsius, this is not Fahrenheit. So if you want to get Fahrenheit multiplied by 1.8. You're talking about changes. You know, in the United States, you're talking about 5 degrees Celsius in the middle of the continent. And up at, well, Alaska is the United States, too. You're talking about, you know, 10 degrees Celsius. It's unbelievable. That's just a totally different world. These are the precipitation changes. What's robust in here is a pattern of moistening at the high latitudes and in the right along the equator, and this pattern of drying the orange across the, what are called the horse latitudes, plus and minus 30 degrees. And these are areas, some of which, particularly in here, which of course periodically have trouble feeding themselves right now. And this is an issue for agriculture when combined with the heat. So I'm only going to talk about one 
consequence. Yeah. There's almost no rain, so you know if you get two millimeters of rain and it goes up to three millimeters, it looks dark on that graph. What's more worth noting are, for instance, the changes in South Africa, which has a climate you know a lot like California, and that drying is troubling. And Mexico too. So um, I'm just going to talk about this effect. There's a whole range of consequences, but that takes a lot, take twice as much time to talk about. Uh, you, I, I worry about human health and uh, heat stroke. Is a, it happens all the time. People die of it. Uh, agricultural productivity, uh, which I just mentioned. Uh, species and ecosystems cannot adapt the way humans can. So there's a long-term threat to biodiversity. And um, then there are the strange extreme outcomes, which we, these are kind of the known unknowns or maybe the unknown unknowns which I'll talk about in a second with regard to one of them, maybe the future of the ice sheets. So now let's move on to sea level rise. These are the same projections that I gave you a minute ago for the two scenarios, except this is for sea level. This is not for temperature. And one notices, again, the slower warming world. You get the lower sea level rise, something on the order of uh, 40 centimeters over this century. And again, that's about twice the rate we had over the past century. The rate over the past century was enough to give us a lot of headaches. The rate's going to double. We're not prepared to deal with that. But it's a lot better than what happens in the high scenario where you get sea level rise of the order maybe as high as a meter within 100 years. It's huge. And again, I'll show you in a minute what, what some of that implies. Okay, now this is just show, the point of this slide is to show you that sea level rise is not a global phenomenon. It happens globally, but it is not uniform globally. And the reason for that is a bunch of local factors which give some areas higher sea level rise than others. Ocean circulation changes are one reason, because they're relatively local phenomena, or at least regional. Another reason, the, the one I love the best, is this. If the ice sheets, let's think about the Greenland ice sheet, big, big mass of ice. It's so big that it actually has a gravitational attraction on the water in the North Atlantic. And it pulls the water towards the ice sheet. And there's actually a bulge in the North Atlantic, kind of a ring around the Greenland ice sheet. As the ice sheet melts, it lets that bulge go. That means certain areas of the far North Atlantic actually could see a, a, a lesser than the global average sea level rise because this negative effect is happening. They're sitting on a bulge now, and the bulge goes somewhere else. It basically dissipates around the whole ocean. Other areas of the world actually are the recipients of the water in the bulge. So their sea level rise is higher than the global average. So most areas will get a sea level rise plus or minus about 70% of the global average. But some of them get lucky and actually have a, a drop, slight drop in sea level. That's only a small area, uh, if, if assuming the Greenland ice sheet melts in northern Europe. Most of the world has a positive sea level rise, but it's not a positive, the same positive amount everywhere. Now, so yeah, these are the three reasons I talked to you about before about why sea level is rising. When you worry about sea level, you do worry most about these two ice sheets. The Greenland ice sheet contains about seven meters worth of sea level rise were it all to disintegrate. The Antarctic ice sheet contains about 57 meters of sea level rise. Water world were it to disintegrate. Now, fortunately, most of the East Antarctic ice sheet, which is the bigger part, 90% of it, is stable. And there's no indication that much of it, well, it depends on what you mean by much. There are some areas here that are showing signs of instability, but most of it we know to be stable. So we don't worry about 57 meters of sea level rise. We do worry about a few meters from these areas and about four meters from the West Antarctic ice sheet, which is known to be at least partially unstable. And when I say unstable, I mean it's sensitive to rapid change if it's tweaked by a climate change. And by rapid, I don't mean one year. I mean a few hundred years. So it's a geologically fast, but in your 
sense, a slow process which plays out over a, a few centuries, probably, although there's a recent estimate that has it faster. So that means what you want to worry about from a time frame of 100 to 200 years is 5 plus 7. The Greenland ice sheet is stable, but melting stably. It's just sort of gradually melting away like an ice cube. So 5 plus 7 plus a few more meters down here. And you know, you're talking about 12, 15 meters of sea level rise potentially, and that's big enough, especially if it's a big enough headache, especially if it plays out over the course of not a few thousand, but a few hundred years, which is plausible right now. OK, the main reason the West Antarctic ice sheet is unstable, at least parts of it, is it's based below sea level. It's ice sitting not on land, but ice sitting on sea bottom. And so as, the, as warm water gets under the ice sheet and it starts to melt, it starts retreating in an unstable process because more melting just lets more water underneath, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. That's a simplification. Okay? But we don't understand much about that process. Ice sheets are one of the big question marks. Ice doesn't just melt, it flows. So you think of an ice sheet as forming when you have a continent which is very cold and snow falls, it builds up a hill of ice, and the pressure, the gravitational weight of the ice itself squeezes the ice out from underneath and pushes it towards the edge, pushes it towards the sea where it kind of lips over the sea and then starts making icebergs. We understand the melt process pretty well, and in Antarctica, it occurs only at the edges because it's cold. In Greenland, it occurs over most of the ice sheet because it's warmer. But we don't understand this ice flow process. So we don't have a good handle on how fast this melting or this discharge of ice into the sea, which raises sea level, will occur. We know it happens. We, parts of Antarctica are already experiencing it. We can't project it. We don't have a good model. It's one of the big, most important unknowns with climate change. But we do see some things happening very fast there. This is an ice shelf. That's, the ice shelf is this thing I showed you here, this little thing lipping over the ocean. It kind of, these things get jammed um, around the rocky bedrock, and they slow the flow down a little bit, and that's good for us. But, I'm sorry, the wrong one. But, these things also are very subject to melting because they're just floating over water, and water's not frozen. It's warm. So if the water warms a little further, it can make these things unstable. You could see this thing, which was on the Antarctic Peninsula, which is the arm that sticks up towards South America. These dark spots are melt ponds. January 31, 2002. Five weeks later, the thing just, you know, like a piece of glass being dropped on the sidewalk, just cracks open. In five weeks, this thing here is the size of the state of Rhode Island. And it just fragmented because of an instability. Those are the kinds of processes which govern the behavior of ice sheets and which we are not competent to project right now. We just don't know how to do it. Can I ask, um, this is a 2002 example. That's 13 years ago. It's stopped. The process has now stopped, I guess? Well, there's no, what happened is, for the time being, there's no ice floating there. But what happened, it's a good question. See, these, these are glaciers. Mm -hmm. They were being penned back, held back by this frozen piece of ice. The minute it disappeared, they accelerated. And they started moving. And this, this ice raises sea level, because it's land-based ice. They started draining up to eight times as fast into the ocean. And luckily, this is on the Antarctic Peninsula, which let me, let me go back and show you what the Antarctic Peninsula is. It's this this skinny arm, and it's way up on the top of the skinny arm, so there's not much ice there. Even if you lost all of it, it's not the end of the world. What we're worried about is that kind of process happening in the other parts of Antarctica, like right there where there's a giant ice shelf. And again, we just don't have the tools. We don't have the models. We don't have the, the brains to solve that problem right now. And that's what happens if, you know, this is uh, Florida today. The president was just down there yesterday. Well, he's down the other day, it's Earth Day, extolling the virtues of the Everglades, which are not long for this world if these rates of sea level rise occur. This is, if uh, the Greenland ice sheet goes, it starts looking like that. If the uh, Greenland and West Antarctic ice sheet goes, it starts looking like that. And at some future time, if we let the world warm by 10 degrees Celsius, 
then that does happen. You don't need the instability. But I don't think we're going to let it get there. I'm not actually, in that sense, an optimist. It's not much to be optimistic, but you know, <laughs> it shows you how sad things are that that makes for optimism. Anyway, my research group did a lot of calculations over the last few years of what the rate of sea level rise might be in the future, doing our best within the limited capabilities of the models we have. Uh, this, because the models are limited, you have to do an interesting combination of some methods we developed for combining what are called process-based models, the real physics that underlies these problems, with what's called expert judgment. You get people who supposedly know what's going on in a room, and you get their best advice on what's actually happening. You try to fill the gap between what the models say and what the experts think are going to happen, and you do it in a systematic way. And in that way, you make best estimates. This is a lot, in some ways, res uh, resemble, the techniques in some ways resemble financial or market modeling these days. Of course, since the financial crisis, that, I shouldn't be saying that, but. There is some resemblance between these modeling approaches. Anyway, for New this is five, four different places on the East Coast where we are stuck with this higher than global sea level rise. There's the global mean sea level rise. This is in the high case of business as usual case by the year 2100. So for New York, you notice the median, the best guess, so to speak, is close to a meter. Close to a meter is the best guess. Global average about 0.8 in this high emissions case. We might not have the highest emissions, you don't know. And there's a 5% chance that it's less than half a meter. And then there's a 5% chance, since these are all probabilistic projections, that it's greater than a meter and a half. This is a daunting amount of sea level rise. And it had this, these projections were done for. Um, originally stimulated because I'm on the, was appointed to the New York Panel on Climate Change, which is the mayor's office advisory body on the technical aspects of climate change. And um, Mayor Bloomberg put it together. I was appointed to the panel in its second incarnation. And we did these calculations so the city would be able to make a plan for dealing with these kinds of changes. And this was stimulated largely by the outfall from Hurricane Sandy. And just to show you how big these challenges are, um, this map gives you the multiplier effect, by how, which tells you how much more often a big flood happens in each particular area where the dot is, assuming sea level rises by a global average of about half a meter, which is a little less, actually, than what the previous slide showed you. And what this means is, you know, you've heard the expression, the 100-year flood. What that means is a water level that's achieved only once in 100 years on average. As sea level rises, those floods, which happen when storms come around, are, happen more and more often. Because you know, sea level rises, storm come along, comes along, you're starting from a higher baseline, essentially. It's, it, one way to think about it is Manhattan, in most places, certainly over here, I live in the village and I, I measured it, sort of eyeballed it, has a seawall a bulkhead, and it's about five foot off mean high tide. So if a storm comes, the 100-year the, uh, storm in, in uh, lower Manhattan would be a flood of about eight feet. So about once every 100 years, historically, we'd expect to go about three feet above the seawall. In the future, as sea level rises, you can imagine it's going to go above the sea level more often because the same storm with the same surge will push it to a higher level. So you get the flood happening more often. This number here, determined on this scale, gives you the multiplier effect so that you can say if you have a 100-year storm and ha you get the flood level once in 100 years, in the future with sea level higher, how often does it happen? Well, for New York, you're in this yellow zone you'll see the multiplier is about 50. So toward the end of the century, what was a 100-year storm is the two-year storm. At the battery, yeah, at the battery, Hurricane Sandy was somewhere between a 500 1,000-year storm, which means at the end of the century, even if the storms don't change, if the sea level goes up, you've got a storm which is, uh, the storm like that's happening every 10 or 20 years. And we haven't yet recovered from Hurricane Sandy. That, that kind of, and by the way, it just increases after that. So th that's the kind of information that got the attention of the mayor's office. Now remember, 
the risk is not just about the physical changes, but it's about the exposed real estate or people and how vulnerable it is. You could build buildings, as is happening some places in the Netherlands, for instance, which are, and New Jersey coast, which are on stilts and pretty rugged, and they're not vulnerable. They're exposed to the storms, but they're not vulnerable particularly. You may not want to build everything that way. But that's the kind of thinking you have to do, or you build a big seawall if you live along the coast in the future. Instead, this is what we have now. This is Atlantic City. I love Atlantic City because it gives me the best example to use of trash development, basically. I mean, look at that. You know, there's the sea, and there's billions of dollars worth of buildings. Of course, they're all going out of business anyway, it looks like. So maybe it's <laughs> sea level. Why worry about sea level rise? This is what uh, the Sandy Flood looked like. These areas, this is the, uh, the red is the, um, the red is the this fl sa Sandy Flooding area. The orange is the 500-year storm. That's an estimate since nobody was here 500 years ago, and we have to estimate it through various ways. The yellow is the 100-year um, flood level. And you could see that for much of the city, uh, Sandy seems to have mostly covered the 500- the, uh, the and 100-year flood level. But it's uneven. In some parts of the city, it was probably only a 50-year storm. In the Battery, was probably actually the worst place. And there it covers the 500-year storm level pretty clearly. So uh, what is, you know, what's the city? Uh, and by the way, this is also my favorite figure about the risk. This is the, Sandy was not the first bad storm we had, after all. We've had floods for the last 60 years. Those of you who are old enough remember Hurricane Donna, Hurricane Carol in the early 50s. Then there were the famous 92 Nor'easter, which some more of you may remember. This is, these are the flood levels for each of those storms. The dashed curve. The dashed line is the level that the water has to get to to flood the New York City subway system. And that is, in some sense, the worst possible outcome. Because we got lucky this time, and they got the water out quickly. But that won't always happen if this keeps happening. And the, the system will basically corrode away pretty quickly. And that's what they're worried about, especially an irreplaceable signal system. It would have been down for, eight, for a long, long time. Anyway. Here are the, the, the nine earlier storms, the nine biggest storms before Hurricane Sandy. Then it's Hurricane Sandy. You can see it's so much bigger than everything else. But look at this. Most of these other storms are only within a foot or less of flooding the subway system. So we got lucky a bunch of times. And if you get sea level rise of one, two, or three feet, you've had it. So you better have a way of protecting the subway. And you know what? They knew this for the last 20 years. This is the 92 Nor'easter. I remember it well. One of my colleagues at the Environmental Defense Fund almost got trapped in the subway in the um, path station in Hoboken, which did flood. I'll show you a picture of that in a moment. And he almost uh, didn't survive. And you know, it was very close to flooding New York City subway system. So they learned all these lessons. And they had all these plans to plug the tunnels to raise you know, those gratings on the street, the air vents. Those are going right down the subway. You know, water, grating. You know, we can't have that kind of system anymore. So there was big talk. Nothing was done. Then there was a huge rainstorm, two inches in an hour, uh, about seven, six or seven summers ago, uh, which did flood part of the subway system, but it's fresh water, so not as damaging. They got it out pretty quickly. And the governor, at that point I think it was Elliot Spitzer, uh, got angry. And he insisted they raise some of those subway gratings. And they did on a, several of the stations downtown near uh, uh, Bowling Green, I think. And then they stopped because they, you know, their attention went elsewhere. And uh, all these other plans they had, like plugging the subway tunnels temporarily when, when there's a storm coming, like plugging the road tunnels, all the infrastructure issues, none of it got done. And that's one reason why Sandy was so bad. It's not that we didn't have a warning about it. And by the way, Sandy was nowhere near the worst storm that we could have had. If you take the worst storm in the historical record, this is a calculation we did in July before Sandy came in October. It temporarily made us famous because we actually had a, a storm that hit New Jersey in about the right place. And you notice that the, the storm surge reaching into the flood, uh, this is the flood level, reaching the battery where the star is, is about uh, 
is about a full meter above what the sandy surge was. So, and this is based on synthesis of stor all storms that could occur based on storms we know occurred in the historical record. And so there was one in 1821, which was bigger than Sandy, but it came at low tide. Sandy had this confluence of happenstance of being huge, coming at high tide, more or less, and taking that odd bend back towards the coast. Doesn't happen very often. But there are, it's not the only storm like that that ever happened. So what our objective now is to try to figure out this, what happens in what's called the tail of the distribution, where you have infrequent, very big storms and they ha happen very rarely in the historical record. They're in what's called the tail. But as the world warms, both because the sea level rise, the flood levels are higher, and because the storms may, be, may get more intense, that's what's expected to happen to tropical cyclones like hurricanes, you sort of move the tail in, and some of these storms that used to be rare all of a sudden are happening a lot more often. That's the, calc that's the work we're trying to do. That's the analysis, and it's tough, not easy. Um, Okay, so one thing they have, so the question is, so what's New York City doing now? Are we moving ahead now that we had this punch from Sandy? And the answer is, so far, it looks like they're serious. And I say this very cautiously. So they've done things like, these were, the, remember the hospitals during Sandy. Patients had to be carried out. The gener emergency generators were in the basement, so when the lights went out, you know, the emergency generators didn't start. Uh, or the fuel was in the basement and it got flooded, it got wet, nothing could be done about it. Now there's a new rules and any new hospitals have to be away from the coast on higher ground. And the ones that are near the coast, they have to take special measures by getting the generators and the fuel out of the basement. That's just an example. Have we started with plans to plug the tunnels? No, not that I know of. Have we got plans to raise the gratings? Yeah, those seem to be moving along. Whether they'll actually do it, I don't know. But we have to be, you know, you need, oh, this is the thing about the, uh, this, is Hobo, this is a Hoboken Pass station in the 1992 Nor'easter when my friend almost got it. This is during Sandy, the same damn thing happens. That makes me furious. Like, you know, didn't learn anything. Um, louder. I tell you what, I only have three minutes. I've given myself three minutes. Hold it, and I'll ask you during the question period, OK? So, so um, what do we, you know, can we expect the city officials to stay on it? So on, a good, on the good side of things, there are some indications that think plans are moving forward. There's a very art, highly articulated plan that Bloomberg rolled out. There's some indication that some of it's going to get done under de Blasio. On the other hand, de Blasio, who I generally think is a good guy, just relabeled his, the plan YC as something else and said a big component of it is going to be uh, income equality, which is fine with me unless it also buries in the process the plans to protect us against these future storms, which is going to be a growing risk. You, you know, and it's hard. This is, a real, this is real political judgment. A mayor comes in. He's got different priorities, and, you, and, and no mayor gets a lot of stuff done. He's got to pick and choose, just like Obama got some things done, and they can't get everything done. And these are decisions that will be made. And stuff like this, which is kind of long term, and maybe not as immediate as, uh, as fixing the equality income equality situation, it may get lost. And we should keep our eyes on that. But there are lots of reasons why politicians don't deal effectively with these problems. The episodes are infrequent. Even though there have been 10 big floods in the last uh, you know, 60 years, that's one every six years. And the terms, that, you know, a term for a politician is two, four, or eight years, so they tend to not focus on it. Memories are short, the average person forgets. You go around and ask most people in the city about Sandy, well, they remember, but what they remember is vague unless their house burnt down. And if you ask people in the rest of the country, they don't know what the hell was going on. I remember because when my floor was on the fifth floor, I was on the 15th floor. And so, so you're never going to forget, but that didn't happen to most people, and that's the trouble. Um, the planning times are long. If you were going to protect the subway system, there are certain things that can be done quickly, but many of those things are done over decades. For instance, potentially, as I'll show you, building a surge barrier to protect the city, which we would need maybe, and certainly if the ice sheets keep deteriorating. 
the risk is increasing continually. Politicians tend to like to ignore problems, hoping that they go away, because you know what? Sometimes they do. And it's the easy out. Well, it's not going to happen in this case. And then the political incentives are all wrong. If you're a mayor, the federal government comes in and helps you after a disaster by cleaning up. The federal government is supposed to, but in fact does not allocate hard, uh, allocates hardly any money to building resi resilience in advance of storms. So that if you, on a crude, uh, you know, political, uh, 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 politi you know, what's the easiest thing to do politically? It's let the storm happen and let the federal government come in and clean up. Because if you have to spend a million, billions of dollars of the city's own money to protect the city in advance for something that might not happen during your term in office, you're just less likely to do it. I'm not, I don't want to be too cynical, because we know we are capable of building big things that need to be done and planning in advance, like the water supply system, the sewage system, the subway system. But those are all hard, and they don't happen immediately. This is very difficult to do politically. But they should happen immediately, because that's the foundation of the Well, good luck. <laughs> on, on the other hand, there's stuff that can be done which isn't difficult. And my fa I'm going to end this. My favorite story is about Bangladesh. Bangladesh, very poor country, 150 million people packed into an area the size of Wisconsin. Uh, they, the whole country is almost at sea level. They're victimized regularly by tropical cyclones, which are their form of hurricanes coming up the Bay of Bengal. In 1970, at a time of political upheaval due to the civil war with what is now Pakistan, the, um, a, a million people died in a cyclone. We think, they would, you know, there is no good census, but something of that magnitude. Recently, in the same size cyclones, the death rates are down to several thousand. Still not good, but, you know, two orders of magnitude better. Why? Because the country's governance situation improves. Still not the best government in the world, but better. They um, developed an early warning system to actually get people to know there was a storm coming. And they built these relatively cheap bunkers, which are on stilts and were concrete, so people, once you'd warned them, actually had some place to go. The net effect is in Bangladesh, where they did all this stuff, the death rates again are down to a few thousand. You go to the neighboring Myanmar, where the government still stinks and is disorganized, the death rates in the same type of storm, right next door, are in the tens of thousands. You, so it it I'm not sure. I'm not sure. So things that are relatively inexpensive can be done that save a lot of lives in a very poor country. You can't tell me that we can't get it together to do some relatively straightforward things here while we think about the bigger things. Do we need a surge barrier on the estuary that we live on the way that um, London has on the Thames? I don't know what the answer to that is. And then I'll end with this slide, which is a bit of good news. This is US emissions of greenhouse gases. They peaked in 2007. They're on the way down to, due to a variety of things, one of which are the regulations, which if the Supreme Court lets them stand, will keep these emissions going down for some time. That, with the deal we made with China in November, gives me some hope. Thank you.